Zoom call. Um, I mentioned that I'm in Nashville. So um, uh, Nashville is a city of about 750,000 people, and we have been growing like crazy. Uh, of course, that the recent virus, I know everyone is in sort of suspended animation, but we're hoping we survive this as other large cities are struggling through this. But it's a great place to live. If you're an artist who likes to paint portraits, it's a particularly great place to live because the South has had a long tradition of uh, collecting portraits of family members as in businesses and things like that. And um, we are about 10 minutes from downtown Nashville. Uh, used to be even faster, but we have a little traffic now. And um, we found a, a home here. I've known about it for 30 years, but purchased a home here about eight years ago that has over two acres around it and it's um, really private. So I've got this sort of great little mixture of a tiny bit of the country and the city and it's been wonderful. Uh, the house is um, 95 uh, years old. And um, as Peggy mentioned, some of you heard a moment ago, we had some really terrible storms here about three weeks ago and I lost several 100 year old plus trees and even had one to fall in the house. So it was a real mess, but we're in the process of cleaning up. I added my studio onto the house in 2013 and um, you're gonna see that in a moment. Um, so I have been an, an artist, I think all of my life, but I didn't really embrace the idea that it could be uh, something that I made my living doing until I was in college. I had no examples in my family of um, visual artists. I had a lot of musicians in my family, but no, no artists, no, no painters or, or anyone that worked in that area of uh, the creative pursuits. I had an uncle, my mother's brother, who could draw really well. And he would sit and draw for me as a kid and I would try to copy some of his drawings, but he had no training. Um, and so that was the, probably the first person I ever saw to really draw. But when I was in college, after a couple of years, I decided to take a few classes that were not related to my major, which was a biology major. And I took a drawing class. And just from the moment I was in class, I fell in love with the whole idea of doing more of it. And I was lucky enough to meet a painting instructor named Dawn Whitelaw. Some of you may know, she's a terrific painter. And she was teaching painting uh, two times a week at my university. And I signed up for her class and I found out that she was actually a full-time uh, artist and she painted portraits mainly for her living. And um, I had always loved people. So the idea of combining my love of art and love of people uh, really fit, but I could not have started from a simpler place. So the first artist that I ever really saw paint was on public television. And it wasn't Bob Ross, the big hair guy. It was his predecessor named Bill Alexander. And Bill Alexander um, had a show on PBS and he painted every Saturday and that's what it came on here. And I went to, when I was 15 years old, I went to a local art store I used my first three paychecks from a grocery store where I sacked groceries and I bought a Bill Alexander paint set, a couple of canvases and the only easel that I could really afford, which I didn't know at the time was sort of useless, but it was a presentation easel. You've seen those three spindly legs and a chain in the middle and that's it. So I set it up in my parents' garage and propped open the little manual that came with the paint. And as any good Southern boy would, would do, I tried to paint a, a barn sitting, you know, a little red barn. And every time I would take the paintbrush and touch the canvas, the, the feet of the easel would scoot and scoot, and then it would collapse on the floor. And I had no clue why this was happening. My mother came out, we looked at the one page of instructions, we tried to figure out, like, is the chain in the wrong place? And I I, we gave up and I took duct tape and taped the feet of the easel to the floor in the garage. And then I found that when I started painting, the easel didn't collapse. Uh, and I did a miserable little painting of a barn. Why do I tell you this silly story? Because I don't know where you are in your journey, whether you've been painting for a very long time or not very long at all, but you're looking at a guy that could not have started in a simpler place. I had no idea what I was doing at all, except that I really, really wanted to try to paint. 
And I'm not sure that I can explain why that is. It was just in me that I wanted to try to do it. So uh, when I go back, bouncing back now to college and met Dawn, the only experience I really had was watching the television painters on PBS. And by that time, I'd been introduced to a woman on TV named Helen Van Wyck and watched her show on painting every Saturday. And another artist that had taken over from Bill Alexander, which has now become an American icon, Bob Ross with the, the big hair. And some of you who watch those painters know that they can make a pine trees with a fan brush and the mountains with the palette knife and the snow on the mountains. And I became very proficient at that. I, I, could, I could do some doggone good pine trees with my fan brush. And I also learned some habits that I found out weren't necessarily that um, encouraged in class. And some of you may remember Bob Ross would take his brush, clean it in the turpentine, and then he would slap it across the bottom of his easel and pat it across there. And the very first day I was in painting class with Dawn, I was painting away and I took my brush, cleaned it, and then I slapped it all over the easel, you know, popped it real out. And Dawn was across the room and said, who did that? Who did that? And I said, me, I was cleaning my brush. I learned it from Bob Ross. And she said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> so that was my beginning of weaning away from television painters. Um, I absolutely fell in love with the challenge of it from the very beginning, but I knew nothing about color. I experimented, of course, with trying to paint, but when I look at those pieces from early on, they're very raw. So if I needed a blue sky, I just squirted out some ultramarine blue and put a little white in it, and maybe that was it. Um, I remember doing a still life in class once, and I did not know the concept of seeing color and shadow. If you ask me what color was a shadow, my answer, David, was shadow. That's all I knew. And Dawn said to me, don't you see any color in that? I said, no. I said, can't I purchase a, just a tube that says shadow? That'll work for everything. <laughs> and she said, no, no, you're, I'm going to teach you to see color in shadow. And she took a, a little piece of gray card and she poked a hole in it. And I held it up and looked at the shadows of the still life objects through that gray card with the hole. And it was like someone had lifted a curtain for me. I suddenly saw color that I never knew existed in a place that I never knew had color. So it was an incredible journey of discovery, but um, it really could not, again, have come from less experience. So um, I painted through college. I graduated with a degree in advertising, marketing, and um, graphic design, and not fine art because um, I had no idea what I would do with a fine art degree, but I had convinced my dad who, I'm so grateful who paid for my education. I had convinced my dad that I needed a lot of elective classes in order to just make myself more well-rounded. So I took as many art classes as I could that I didn't need for my major. And I turned out to only be one sculpture class and one art history class short of a studio major. Um, and I'm thankful again that dad didn't really know what he was paying for, but he paid for all the elective courses. But I, my dad gave me the very best advice that I could have ever received. And that was when I graduated from school, I'd already started taking commissions when I was um, a senior in college. But dad said, if you think you wanna be a, an artist that works in a studio, I can't think of a better time in your life than right now at 20, 21 years old, than for you to, tr to try it. And you, you're not married, you have no children, you have no, uh, you have no debt. So he said, why don't you try it? So he helped me find a very small studio, one room studio in an area of town that was a real nice area of town. The rent was $350 a month. I had no idea how I was gonna make the rent, but I rented this one room studio with two north windows and I hung out my shingle and said I was a painter. And then started on this journey of not only trying to grow every day as an artist, but to try to find somebody that would be willing to help support me by buying the work that I was producing. And I, it was the old fashioned way. So most of you probably lived lo a long time before the internet. So we had no way of marketing or sharing in the ways that young artists do today. So I had an old Buick that um, had no air conditioning and I kept the back trunk tied down with a bandana because it always flopped open and I would keep it full of paintings. And if anybody asked me what I was doing, I would take them to my trunk gallery and I would open up the back of the Buick and I would start bringing paintings out. I did that in a grocery store parking lot one day. 
<laughs> lined them up against the side of the Buick and showed this lady who asked me what I was doing now that I graduated. <laughs> and um, I also found that in Nashville, there was a number of charity exhibits and shows where I could donate a painting to the charity, but I would ask, could I be there for the event? And I would meet people. And then I would show them what I was doing. And slowly but surely, I would make enough money to make my rent. Um, I was living on a shoestring, but I was finding a way to get out and hustle. And I was finding a way to um, also, in between trying to produce work that I hoped would sell, I was constantly producing work for my own growth as an artist and experimenting and trying to do the things that I thought would help me grow. Now, one of the life changing moments in my life also happened in school, not only meeting Don Whitelaw 35 years ago now, but in class one day, she was watching me paint and I had a sort of natural um, uh, painterly style just from kind of the way I worked from the beginning. And Don said, have you ever heard of an artist named Everett Raymond Kinsler? And I said, uh, no. And, and the truth was, I had seen his work before, but never made the connection with the name. And she said, um, There's a, there should be a book in the library called Painting Portraits. And you should go over and try to find it. I studied with him last summer in Maine, and it was life-changing for me. He's an incredible artist, and I think his work would really appeal to you. So in my little college library, I, I went to the top floor where the art section was that very day. And lucky for me, the book was there. I took it off the shelf and began to read. And I was engrossed. And I sat down on the floor in front of the shelf. And I read the whole 150-page book over the next three or four hours, looking at every picture. And I always say that when I walked in that library, I was one guy. And when I walked out of that library, I was a totally different man because it absolutely confirmed for me that this is what I wanted to try to do if I could possibly do it for my living. That I, I was driven and I wanted to do what he was doing, which was an, being an artist that painted people. Of course, I was spellbound by the subject matter that he was getting to paint, uh, the people he was getting to paint, but I was more blown away by the quality of the work and the, 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 the incredible um, uh, prolific nature of his work and his skill level to me was I'd never seen anything quite like it. He truly was someone who had captured the ability to produce the work that in the way that he needed it to say what he wanted to say, if that makes sense. It was as if he had the language, the grammar perfectly understood. And then he was able to customize it for exactly the way he wanted to paint you or anything else. So that book became my Bible. Um, I ended up keeping the book and giving them a brand new one. I ex exchanged it. I said, I want this book forever, but I'll give you a brand new book if you'll let me trade it out, which they happily did. I still have it today and it's falling apart, but it's, it was the turning point for me in terms of knowing exactly what I was going to do. So um, in my little studio, here in Nashville in 1991, 92, 93, uh, I would get the occasional portrait and then made a lot of my living on selling paintings of flowers, landscapes, uh, fruit paintings, anything that anyone would give me $100 or $200 for so that I could cover my rent and get my art supplies. Um, so what I think I'll do um, now is I'm going to transition into um, the spaces that I've used by also walking you into the space that I have today. I was in that studio in Hillsborough Village uh, for five years. I then moved upstairs to a space that was twice as large. I was there for about three years. Then I moved again just down the street to another studio that was a lot larger, but it was an attic space which had to be renovated by just uh, blood, sweat, and tears. And I uh, worked there for several years, uh, 14 total years in rented studios in one neighborhood. And then um, in 2003, inspired by a lot of artists that I had known and, and seen their studios, I built a small studio behind my home, a separate building. And uh, I had that studio for about 10 years and then 
seven years ago, we moved to this home and I built the studio that I have now. And um, it, it works really, really beautifully and I'm very spoiled by it. But when I take you here, just do keep in mind that I have worked for a number of years in my parents' garage with no air conditioning in Tennessee, which in July and August, the garage would be about 105 degrees. I would wear bandanas to keep the sweat out of my eyes as I worked. And in the wintertime, uh, it was bitterly cold in there with, you know, say 30 degrees. Then in a basement that used to flood, then in a, a, another studio that was in an attic. Um, so I've kind of, I've, I've sort of had it all and experienced it all. But now I'm pretty spoiled rotten by what I enjoy now. So um, maybe just for a moment, um, I'll stop. David, and if anybody has any questions about that introduction, maybe I can answer two or three questions if anybody wants one, and then we'll go to the studio. Does that sound okay? I hit it, you know, I'm muting all, and there it goes. No, it's still not unmuting all. Where'd he go? There he is. Hold on, please. We got, um, we got muted everybody. Instead of unmuted, we muted. There everybody. we are. There we go. Sorry about that. Did anybody have any questions about any of that? All right. Comments, questions? Anybody want to know how to disconnect? All right. Did you remember that um, that Don had taught at SKB a few years ago? No, I didn't remember that. Oh, great! So everybody's familiar, or many people are familiar with her. Yeah, she she taught the year that Ed was out there. Oh, marvelous! I didn't know that. Yeah, so it was two thousand. All right, great. Well, that that completes the circle then. Yeah. All right. Well, then Maddie's going to take us on our little walk here. So. Behind me is our house, and so I um I walk down this path. Uh, so you can see the this is the south side of the studio, and it was added to the house, which is an old stone house. This is Beasley, by the way, the studio dog. We did have a giant old English sheepdog for ten years. He weighed one hundred and ten pounds. This him passed away now. This is our studio garden, which um, is only seven years old, but it's really coming on nicely. Okay, welcome to my studio, and I wish you could feel the air conditioning which is great the audio um, kind of wonky a little bit out on the how's this am I, am I close enough now still bad that's better Hello. better okay so um the studio of ceiling height is 20 20 can you hear me yeah that's better can you guys hear me yeah, just okay. move the camera Should so I hold quickly. It? All right, I'll hold it for this, man. I'll hold it for this. So um, the first thing is I want to show you that the ceiling is actually 24 feet to the center. So it's really high, and that works great for when I'm working on really large paintings and I want to crank up a 70 or 80-inch canvas, and I can stand and work on the feet and not hit the ceiling. Um, these are my north windows, and uh, it's dead north. And you'll see, actually, Peggy, you'll see this. I had to have the trees chopped back. You remember, mm -hmm. my 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 screening grew too large, and I suddenly didn't have any sky anymore. So we we had to do the big chop. Oh, that wasn't that wasn't um, the, this big storm. That was intentional. No, that yeah, that was an intentional trimming right there because I lost all my sky, which is um, now I've got nice bright north light. Uh, in in uh, my working space. So I'm gonna pan around for a second. Um, fireplace, 
lots and lots of books. Um, a mannequin or two for me to put clothing on for people that I'm, here's this, I'm working on a posthumous portrait of a college professor. These are his old uh, college robes that he wore. Um, he, wore, he was a professor at a university that they wore their robes like they do in England to class every day. Um, here's a tabaret full of a mess of, of paint. I've got some things on the easels, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, over here, my supply area. So I've got brushes there and uh, materials that I need. Um, a mirror so that I can see my work in reverse as I'm working through the day. It's very helpful. Um, over here is a desk area for me, which um, I like having in this position so I can look out at the work that I have that's underway from a distance. And uh, when I'm working, sorry? Like the typewriter. Oh, yes, yeah, 1941 Royal, still works beautifully. It's great. And uh, this is, um, this was Maddie's space until just about a week ago. This is my old drafting table, which I used for quite a while, but Maddie took it over for about five years, I guess. There she is. And, uh, but Maddie just, uh, we just did some renovation on my teaching space, which is out behind this building. And Maddie has moved in for the summer and beyond. So she's out there working now. Uh, and here is my office area. There's my assistant, Becca, hard at work over there. And this is an area that we have uh, visiting with people and also it works really well uh, as a guest area and it has a kitchenette and a bathroom and then up the stairs um, it goes to a, a bedroom. Uh, Mr. Kessler and Mrs. Kessler have stayed, uh, Everett and Peggy have stayed up there uh, before. This is what we call, the, after a couple of visits, Everett realized that I really needed a better rail. So I had this rail made and we named it the Kenster rail because it was all for Everett. So he could use that to go upstairs. This by the way is a drawing I did of him, which was the first thing he ever saw of mine that I did in 1992 and uh, he signed it and I, I've kept it all these years and treasure it. Um, so that's the, uh, the office and then here's the studio. And then just a real quick peek, you can see how it's connected to the house because there's the house and it leads out over here to the studio. So now uh, let me show you around a little bit um, on my canvases. So um, I work with a traditional kidney-shaped palette, usually a pretty limited um, series of colors, and um, this is uh, what I would lay out to sort of start the day. It's based on Everett Kinsler's palette, which he based on John Singer Sargent's. Um, in the background, you'll see canvases st stacked up and everything that is stacked up are, is um, things that are underway at different stages of development. Uh, this is a portrait I'm working on of a college president that um, I'm hoping will, I'll get to have sit soon. This is a portrait I've just finished up of Congressman John Lewis and um, that is, uh, going to be delivered here shortly. This is a canvas that I'm working on, a portrait of a, a very beautiful and young uh, private school head mistress or head of school that died at 50 years old, sadly, of cancer. And I'm doing a posthumous portrait of her, which are particularly hard to do. A uh, man in Dallas I'm working on, and they go and go. Um, I'll show you this stack of canvases are sketches, compositional sketches for things that either I've done or are currently working on, recently working on, or haven't started yet. There's all kinds of head sketches, things of that nature. There's more there. These are preliminary sketches of things that I'm going to be working on or currently working on. Uh, more unfinished portraits. I have a lot of portraits that I have got to a point where I really need to see my client, but I have only 
just this week, Nashville began to open up from the COVID stuff. And I've only had a couple of sitters, but I've just begun to have people come and we kind of social distance, but they can pose for me. This is a doctor in New York that I'm hoping to take up for a sitting soon. Uh, this is a, a little um, girl. I have to tell you, I painted this little girl's father when he was the same age. So now I'm beginning to feel like I'm getting a bit older. Um, Peggy, I, I, and I've joked one time that Everett said, wait till they call you about their grandchildren. So, <laughs> um, and then um, the posthumous portrait I'm doing, these are all in different stages. Uh, this one, this I've had two sittings with this man, a head of a university music school, uh, ladies portrait here. Uh, again, waiting for sittings, uh, a judge, that I'm waiting to have an appointment with. Uh, this amazing um, judge here that I'm excited to paint who has quite an incredible story to tell about his life. Uh, another man back here. So these are all paintings that I'm hoping soon I'm going to have the, um, the client back in. This, this is, by the, by the way, a typical canvas. Um, I always leave a little extra which was taught to me by Ray Kinsler to always leave a little extra in case you need to change the composition a bit and I can make adjustments to uh, a painting if I decide I need a little more room at the top or at the bottom. Here's a drawing that I did recently of, um, some of you might remember a guy named Ross Perot. And um, I got the commission to paint Mr. Perot right before he died. And then four, within four months, he was diagnosed with leukemia and died before we got it off the ground. And I was really saddened. And I also was um, disappointed that I wasn't going to get to meet him and paint him. But since that time, his family has decided that they want me to go forward with the painting. So I'll be painting him posthumously. And I'm actually making my first plane trip in almost three months next week to go to Dallas. This is a 94-year-old former cancer uh, researcher that I'm just starting a portrait of. And this is a study for a larger painting of a lady that I'm going to be doing who um, uh, is really a, a really neat Nashvilleian, a uh, very a big philanthropist here in town and uh, has been a horse breeder and, and uh, uh, loves to ride. So she's really neat. Looking forward to spending more time with her. And then, um, one of the things I'm sure all of you have besides your art books, which just cover <coughs> every area of the studio, um, I'm sure you have some treasures around as well. And having known um, Everett Kinsler for as long as I did, I have the great fortune of having a number of things that he's given me over the years that are here in the studio. Something that one of the first gifts he ever gave me that I have not only treasured, but have looked at every single day of my career that I've, that I've had it are these set of hands, which belonged, uh, the, the hands were painted by John Johansson, who was one of Kinsler's big influences. And some of you who may have studied with him uh, at the workshop a few years ago at SKB would have heard him probably speak of John Johansson, who was one of his very close friends, mentors. Above is a hand study by Ray Kinsler, which I actually bought at auction, uh, an online auction uh, of a bishop that uh, the portrait is reproduced in one of Ray Kinsler's books from the early 1970s. One of my greatest treasures that I also bought at auction is this Kinsler drawing, you can see it from all the reflections, of George Bernard Shaw, which was done in 1946 and I think is one of the great, really great stories uh, that Ray Kinsler told. And so I'd encourage you to to read about that in one of his books. It's really wonderful. But to me, it's remarkable that, uh, that Ray Kinsler did this drawing when he was in his 20s and Shaw was 90. And then I got, I purchased it when Ray Kinsler was 90 and had a chance to show him the, the drawing for the first time in many years. He had, had lost, it had been sold years ago and he had lost track of it. So I'm excited to have that. These are some pencil drawings by Ray Kinsler of some hands. And then above is a charcoal head of James Montgomery flag in profile that says, uh, uh, I think I look something like this, which I think is really 
right? And then another painting I look at every day is this wonderful little study for what was going to be a larger portrait by John Johansson. Um, I think to uh, Everett's knowledge, uh, Everett Kinsler's knowledge, the portrait was never created, at least not just like this, but this is an old study probably from about 1920 or so on a panel. Um, and then this is a, a recent, recent acquisition Peggy knows about. This is a drawing of Ray Kinsler's from when Ray Kinsler was 12 years old from 1938. Isn't that great? Look at that. Not bad. Not bad. Um, and then over here, probably, um, uh, no, not probably. What am I saying? Probably. Easily, um, the possession that I treasure the most is this palette, which belonged to John Singer Sargent. And uh, it was my 50th birthday present from Ray Kinsler, who owned it for about uh, 30 or years or so. And uh, the story is here. Uh, the palette was, went from Sargent directly to George Brockhurst in 1925. And after George Brockhurst died, it went to Paul Burns in 1978. And then Paul Burns gave it to Raymond Kinsler in 1987. And uh, there's Mr. Sargent himself. And then um, every Kinsler surprised me uh, at my, on my 50th birthday, uh, almost two years ago, with um, giving me the palette to be the custodian of. And what's amazing about the palette is it's the only known palette that belonged to John Singer Sargent that has been in the collection of only artists since the days when Sargent used it to paint who knows what. Richard Orman, Sargent's great nephew, believes that the palette dates from pro approximately 1900. So it could be a few years before or after. And uh, there's no telling who he painted with it or what he painted with it. But you'll see um, it's got quite a bit of age. It even has the original sticker on the back from the art store in London, which still exists and uh, has Sargent's name written on the sticker. Uh, there's a Sargent letter that I keep beside it, a handwritten letter by Sargent. And a couple of letters that Mr. Kensler gave me through the years. These two are from Robert Henry. Um, Peggy, one of my favorites is this letter from Robert Henry, which came to me at a perfect time. It's dated in 1916, but I was complaining about being overwhelmed and not being able to keep up with my work, just having so much work at, at a time when I, I mean, a lucky problem to have, but I was very overwhelmed. And Everett really felt like that I was taking on too much. And this letter is from Robert Henry to a man named Mr. Goddard and he's turning down a project <laughs> to Mr. Goddard saying that he just can't take it on at the present. And uh, right on the heels of me having several long conversations of being overwhelmed with work and not knowing what to do, this came as a surprise gift in the mail. And he said with the note, Peggy, if Robert Henry can pass up some things, so can you. And so um, I, I began to sort of sometimes say no to certain projects that I really didn't need to take on at the time. Um, and so um, that's a bit about some of the, the uh, studio and the treasures that I, oh, here's some more, look. This is a pen and ink by Ray Kinsler from 1940 something, I forget the exact date, but it's from the 40s. And then there's a wonderful head by John Johansson, which I think I wanna tell this story because this is good. So John Johansson had a studio in the National Arts Club above Ray Kinsler. There it is. And one day Ray Kinsler goes to visit John Johansson in his studio and the 80 plus year old man in July is in front of his fireplace in his studio, cutting up old canvases that were rolled up and burning them in the fireplace. And Ray Kinsler couldn't believe it. And there were all these bits and pieces that were being thrown into the fire. And he said there were so many gorgeous hands or heads and he talked Mr. Johansson into allowing him to have this head before it was thrown into the fire. He also got an arm with a hand and a couple of other things. And so Kinsler has kept this since the early 1960s. And it's amazing that it survives, but it is the former president 
of the National Academy of Design. And it was an abandoned portrait that Johansson started completely over. And then the new canvas that was produced in the 20s is hanging or was hanging at the National Academy's building. And then this was one that was abandoned, but I just think it is a, a beautiful head, probably done in one session, maybe two from life. And um, I'm so glad that Everett Kensler saved it from the flames that day. Um, this is a little Andrew Zorn, uh, see if I can pull it down here. A little Andrew Zorn pen and ink drawing of two female nudes and see Zorn's signature down there on that. That was also a beautiful Ray Kensler birthday present somewhere along the way. I can't remember, but it's been many years ago. So anyway, let me tell you just a little bit now about my process. This is just the beginning of yet another posthumous portrait. I'm painting too many dead people right now. This is not a good, this is not very exciting, but I'm, I'm sadly not gonna get to know this man, but he's a, this former college professor I mentioned to you. And you'll see that I'm just first sketching in with charcoal. This is vine charcoal, working from a series of photos. I don't have any one great photo. And I'm just starting to kind of use a brush to draw just the way you guys do. In this case on a white canvas because I didn't get it stained, but I really prefer often to work on a tone canvas because it's, it's much easier to judge color and value. And in the, in the next few days, I'll block this in with color. This, um, this is a good example, I think. Sorry, let me turn this around. Maddie's still here, but I've, I've, I've sadly got control of the phone for a moment. Uh, this portrait is um, completely blocked in. And what's important about showing this to you, those who are interested maybe in the way that I work, is that everything is established in the painting, even though nothing is really finished. But I have the entire painting blocked in. I like, and has been, I've been taught all of my career by Ray Kensler and others, that, should I move in closer, Peggy? No, no, would you like me to go up and get the little head that you did while you were here? Oh, that would be wonderful. Okay, I'll, Thank I'll you. get it. Yeah, so Peggy's referring, this was, um, this is a college president in Connecticut. And when, when Mr. Kensler passed away, he had a number of commissions that he had never begun. And I have taken those on. And so I've actually already produced several portraits in the last year that he had not started, but that the clients kindly uh, asked me to pick up uh, the project and finish them. And so this one was a college president that Everett Kinsler was going to paint. So what Peggy arranged was uh, for me to come to Connecticut and start this painting in Everett's country studio there. And then I did ahead of him as a study, which she'll show you in a moment. So this head is completely blocked in, but it is not refined. And I will keep refining as I work. You can see here. Okay, I have the head. Ah, there he is. So that one that Peggy's holding was done from life in the studio over a couple of hours one late one evening. Mm -hmm. And then now this has been started from the photographs uh, that I will now be, I'm actually, I'm, I was ready to bring this up, uh, weren't we Peggy in June to have a sitting with him but because of COVID, we've had to postpone, but I'm hoping in August we can have a sitting uh, from life. Thank you, Peggy. That's so helpful. Good. Everybody can see those. I, didn't know it, it, I still have it. I haven't thrown it away. Yes, thank you, thank you for not tossing it. Uh, <laughs> now this one is another, this would be a good example of one that is further along than that man in the robes. And you can see the head is more developed, more refined. Uh, the hand is more refined, but there's still things to do. I've still got areas to refine or to sharpen. Um, and I'm just now ready for a life sitting. I really need to have him in front of me. And so I'm trying to wait that out and hopefully I'll be in New York soon for that. Can you hold that one too, Manny? Um, this one of the, this one of the 90, plus year old um, former uh, cancer researcher has been completely done from photos at this point. I actually did the photo shoot here not long before the big virus hit. 
and began it from photos and then stopped because I didn't want to do any more until I had him come and pose. And I'll probably be a while before I can do that because he would be uh, one of the more vulnerable populations. Um, and he and I have been communicating via, via email. So, um, but this, um, would, this is a start from photographs that I probably have uh, maybe uh, two or three days in at this point. Um, let's see. I use um, hog's hair bristle brushes. Here's my, I never throw one away because I always find that there's something I can do with it even when it gets in bad shape. I wash them at night, uh, wrap them up with a piece of paper towel until they dry and keep them here as an assortment ready to use. And then over in the tabaret that I have, which is by the way, an old spool chest that at some point someone put an iron base on. Um, I keep um, paint inside of here and it's sort of divided. And it, you know, every day it always ends up up here and then we have to put it back in the drawers. Um, Palette knives, charcoal, a tin of charcoal. This is for putting my paint on at night, taking it off the wood palette. And this, like like everybody here, I've got various varnishes and uh, solvents that I can use. All right, I think it would be maybe a good time to take some questions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Maddie. By the way, I, one thing I didn't say that I should say, and that is that, um, you know, my living master, my living hero, all of my career has been Ray Kinsler. Uh, and my historic hero has always been John Singer Sargent. And Sargent is the most remarkable and most gifted artist, in my opinion, that has ever lived. And I love his work and study his work constantly. Uh, over here uh, in this section of books uh, is an entire a section, two shelves of Sargent's. Uh, uh, books on Sargent, above are books on Soroya, uh, P.S. Croyer, Cecilia Bow, some of my other heroes, some other instructional books up there. This is a whole section and a half appropriately. He's right here with Sargent of Ray Kinsler. Uh, a lot of books and magazines uh, that he um, either wrote or his work appeared in. And then on this section here, I keep this is so throwback to the past before the internet. But I started collecting books on interiors years ago, books on houses, architectural books, because I would often take these books in reference for background ideas uh, when I'm creating the portraits. But now, of course, the internet makes it easy to be able to find a lot of resources like that. But I have a large collection there of books on interiors. Um, I love to read and always have loved to read. Maddie Lee shares that passion with me too. Uh, and over here, I've got a series of uh, uh, magazines that I've collected and kept that maybe meant something to me um, and, um, and, uh, and, and other paper notes. That's all my correspondence with Ray Kensler over 27 years. I kept every letter we ever exchanged um, because there was always something that I learned uh, well, sometimes they were just silly, but I always learned mostly uh, from our email and, and written correspondence um, more than anybody that I've ever written or corresponded with. All right, so that's enough. Let me take some questions. So if, you want, if you're on a computer, you can hit your space bar or hit the mute button to talk. Or if you're on your phone or iPad, you have to click the button on your device to talk to Shane. Should I sit so I can see people or should, yeah. Well, we can come over here. We'll come over here and sit down. Maddie will be my camera person. Let me move over here. How's that? Is that better? Let me see. Hello, Wayne Brazil. How are you? And Joel, there's Miss Peggy. Hi, Good. Chuck. Pages here. Oh. Hi, Mary. Christine, Judy, hello. Shane, I have, this is David Rank, and I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, looking at your the various uh, portraits that you have either uh, in development or finished, um, <laughs> I like them all. 
Uh, but Thank you. The, uh, what I'm interested in is your backgrounds. And I'm wondering, uh, some of them that you had, you had um, no background. It was all the one over on the on the left side that was a senator. Yeah. Uh, it had just a stark white background. Yes. And where the figure is um, dominant and stark. Then you have others where uh, the background is the development of, um, I remember one I saw that looked like a neighborhood that was oh, yeah. around one of the figures. Yes. And others you have where they're in like a library or whatnot. Do you like to have a simplistic background? Do you like vignette backgrounds? Or do you like the stark background? Do you have a preference for that? I don't think, I have a slight preference for simpler is better. And I will tell you that in all of the portraits I've painted thus far, over 500 commission portraits in the 30 years I've been doing this, when people are looking through the work, they tend to spend more time and comment more on the paintings that are simpler than the ones that are more complicated in terms of the backgrounds. I think that the simpler background often focuses so much attention on the sitter that the other, if there's very much going on, it can easily be distracting. I have to work extra hard compositionally to make sure that the elements in a background that are included do not compete with the person the, the person that is the focal point of my painter. So it's a, David, it's a bit of a struggle sometimes when you have a client, because you're working on commission work. So sometimes clients walk in the door with a very distinctive idea of what they want, because usually it's based on something they've seen. So they've seen some other portrait that they liked that had, you know, everything that they ever owned in the painting. And right. so they decide that they want this, that, and the other. Sometimes it's a process of me saying, well, I want to keep that in mind, but let's take your, individual uh, personality, your individual likes. Let me visit your home. Let me visit your office. Let me spend time with you. And let's start to see what might feel right. And I'll, But I will keep in mind that you have this idea that you want to have a number of things in the background. Sometimes I will talk someone into something very simple that they began the idea of the, of the commission that it would be a very, uh, it, would, it would be a busy portrait with lots of things in it. But if I have a preference, my preference is that simpler is usually better, and it seems to be the paintings that people are most attracted to that I'm that I'm working on. Uh, here's my website, so um, that's great. You can see there. I have a brand new website, by the way. It just was launched last week, last well, ten days ago or so. I I celebrated my thirtieth anniversary as a full time working artist, and so as part of the rollout, we produced a brand new website that Becca. Uh, Barnes did for me and took her several months to do and we're also just I'll have to plug I, I wrote a book about my my work and my career and my process oh, you get muted are you there yeah you muted yourself now, no, my technical advisor did it. Oh, um, my God. Blame their so I, I knew she was going to be trouble. I knew it. So what I was saying is a uh, brand new website launched to celebrate my 30th anniversary, and I have a new book out, my first book ever. Peggy Kensler did the editing. Ray Kensler wrote the foreword. And, uh, hey, now to really be uh, terribly commercial, you'll notice the top of my website this week, you can purchase my book for 30% off to celebrate my 30th year. Um, here's some examples of my work. Um, there's ladies portraits, a uh, variety of backgrounds. That's why I brought it up for you. Yeah. And um, some of these are quite large. Some of them are life size. Uh, some of them are, are smaller than life. A very recent portrait, uh, that one of Joe Herget, which is the Sister of Ali Herget there, that was just finished recently. Um, the, um, some below there go through a variety of years. So one that I had as much fun uh, painting as I've had uh, with any I've ever painted is the lady with the kimono on that you're seeing now, a red and sort of cream colored kimono. She's standing in her home in Long Island, New York, and she collected antiques.
antique kimonos. And she said she thought she might like to have a portrait painted with a kimono. And that was great fun. It's, it's really large. I mean, the painting's about 80 inches tall. Can you click on that for, for a moment there, Julie Rinaldini? Yes, thank you. There we are. You can see the painting there. And scroll down and you'll actually see me working on it the last day before we finished it. I, we've actually installed it. We've hung it in the spot they wanted it to be permanently displayed. And I'm on a ladder making some final touch-ups of things that I wanted to do and after I installed the painting. And then you see on the right, it actually completed. I also painted her husband in his polo attire, full figure, which was great fun. And uh, you can go back uh, there. Yeah, great. Terrific. Um, and uh, there's, uh, again, a, a variety of approaching. I approach people. I hope that I approach each client with the idea that I am trying to paint a very individual painting and not fall into any kind of trap of just repeating myself by putting someone in the same chair or under the same light or in the same type of background. So I am looking to respond to each person as an individual. And so maybe what's consistent is just the somewhat of the style, but I hope what is not consistent is that no one is being treated equally like in that not being treated that they are just my sitter and they're coming in my studio and sitting in that spot. So I've worked really hard over all of the paintings that I've done to make sure that I am responding to the individual and I am producing individual works uh, of art that happen to be a likeness. And that's one of the challenges of creating portraits is that you, 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 can, you can kind of easily produce a mug shot, you know, the, you measure everything and it's just right but it doesn't mean that it's a good portrait that goes beyond that measurement. One of the things I'll talk about when I'm there in the summer or in September is the two kind of aspects of painting portraits is so valuable. And one is the outer likeness, which is very uh, sort of a process of measuring that I think you can teach anyone that can sort of grasp proportion and scale. But then there's that other element about the feeling, the spirit of the person, the inner likeness. And what decisions do you make in order to capture that one image that someone says, that's exactly David. I mean, I, that's more David than David. I mean, that's what you're after in a, in a successful portrait. That's what when Ray Kensler painted the portrait of John Wayne. It's one of his favorite examples to talk about it being really almost more John Wayne than John Wayne himself. <laughs> enlarging, enlarging the shoulders, giving the torso more presence than even the Duke really had in order to paint the feeling of who John Wayne was and making sure that that was as important, if not a little more important than what the measurable likeness was. Because if you can get the feeling of something, it really does surpass what is an accurate measurement of something. And in portrait painting, that is critical. And that's when you go beyond what is just in front of you. You get into the feeling of, oh, that's wonderful, there it is. I mean, he always pointed out that the torso, the Duke, was even bigger than it really was. But that's the way you felt when you were with John Wayne, that he was so big from the waist up uh, and had that sense of, of strength and power and that familiar position of the hands, which he told Kensler that he had developed that posture when he would stand on the line, on the, on the edges of the football field and had no pockets to put his hands in. So he put his hands on his hips while he was in his football gear back when he was in college. So um, one of my favorite portraits that Ray Kinsler ever painted. I have one other question. Yes, sir. Um, I also have studied John Singer Sargent from the ground up. I, my study is more for his watercolor work that came later in his life. But uh, one of the things that always fascinated me and in recent years, I uh, have studied his charcoal portraits mm. he then did. And I'm wondering if that's a medium that you also work in, uh, the way Sargent did, where he did these beautiful charcoal portraits of people. I, I love to work in charcoal. I do a lot of preliminary studies in charcoal. 
Um, I, I've just been asked by the Portrait Society this fall to do a demonstration in drawing the hands, or drawing the hands, which I'm looking forward to, and I'm going to be doing in charcoal. The Ross Perot that I showed you a moment ago, I'll bring over, or you want to walk over, Maddie? This is done uh, in charcoal on a piece of, is that good? On a piece of uh, Bristol board, it's vine charcoal. Um, and I use a soft or an, and an extra soft. I like the way the charcoal moves around and I can move it with my thumb like paint. I like to take a kneaded eraser to pull lights out. And then something that I learned uh, from Ray Kinsler that every now and then if you can't quite get a light strong enough because the paper itself maybe has received all of the charcoal that it can that you can literally take the end of a Zacto blade and you can scratch a little something right in the paper and create a strong white highlight if you need one for it. Hey, by the way, take it take it take a moment to look up a wonderful drawing that Ray Kinsler did of Carol Burnett and Peggy's got it on his website and it's in his, some of his books. Carol Burnett is wearing these sort of dangly earrings and Mr. Kinsler could not get the light strong enough on the earrings. And so he just took a blade and just scratched the diamonds right into the earrings and it just sparkles. And when you see it in reproduction or even on a wall from a distance, you don't see, oh, there it is, marvelous. Whoever's doing this, thank you, this is great. That earring on her ear is actually the light on the earring has been torn into the paper with a sharp knife and it works beautifully. Mm. And that's, that's, you know, so it's such an excellent example of trying to get the effect yeah, a, more than anything else. That the know, effect is so important. Portrait painter, one of the top ones in the country. And then over here, I'll show you a drawing that I did uh, now, what is it, nearly 30, it's nearly 30 years ago that I mentioned earlier of Ray Kessler. This is done with the same process. This is a piece of Bristol uh, board, uh, two, sort of two-ply, smooth surface, soft charcoal, using a uh, kneaded eraser to pull out lights. You can see he signed it um, with congratulations on a strong, well-handled portrait from your delighted victim, Everett Raymond Kinsley, <laughs> 1993. I have to tell you guys, the only photograph I had was the photo about the size of my thumbnail, but I'd worked part-time in a jewelry store when I was in high school and they gave me a loop, which I kept. And I would hold the photo up to the loop and then I would do the drawing. So that's actually how I produced it. <laughs> By the way, this is a sketch that, that Kinsley did of me uh, 20 years ago. And he did this in about 30 minutes as a demonstration for a class. And of course, I, I treasure that. Um, so I love to work in charcoal. Mm -hmm. Here's some examples from back when I was a student. Um, these are from just a sketch pad. When I was uh, early on looking for things to put on the walls, um, I tore some of these out of my sketchbooks. And these are sergeants. David, you rec hopefully you recognize them. Yeah. As, yeah. Sergeant Reproductions. This is me working with charcoal uh, just in a sketchbook to study Sergeant and to work, try to work in a way and think in a way that he thought as he was trying to develop these heads and trying to become more comfortable with how Sergeant himself uh, used the charcoal. And I mean, I don't make any, uh, I make absolutely no claims that I understand Sergeant. I'm just trying to understand them. But uh, these are examples of many, many drawings and paintings that I did as copies of great artists work in order to understand their work better. Uh, so, um, yes, I, now watercolor, David, I, I enjoy working in watercolor and I have traveled and worked in watercolor uh, a lot over my career. I've only produced one commissioned watercolor portrait, but I will say to everyone something that Ray Kensler said to me often, and he told crowds of artists this over generations, which his belief was, and he was confirmed in this, that if you study the watercolors of John Singer Sargent, you come closer to truly understanding his mastery, um, his curiosity, his incredible craftsmanship, and his attention to detail. Sargent is known as a brushy painter, simplification of his work. But the reason Sargent could simplify so well, and the reason that he understood 
how to simplify something, was his intense study of that thing, whatever it was, and studied it in great detail. And sometimes in those watercolors, particularly the architectural watercolors of uh, Venice, you will see how careful he was in describing a certain piece of sculpture or a decorative element of a column, etc. So Kenser believed that you were seeing Sargent study the world around him through those watercolors and it translated into the work that he would do back in the studio. And it was, uh, the, it was the real way to understanding Sargent. Wonderful. We'll be talking about that when I, when I come in September. We'll talk a lot about that. Maybe I should say real quickly what, what will be very important to me in, uh, in the time that I have uh, there. One will be, I, I will talk a lot about the importance of drawing and how drawing is the fundamental building block of everything that we do as artists or sculptors. Um, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about drawing and how it relates to what you do in painting. Um, I also will talk a lot about the importance of value. And how important it is that you have a grasp of value, not just that you can recognize that something is lighter than something else, you know, this is lighter than that, but to what degree is that lighter and to how many degrees uh, of variation in modeling a form do you need and what do you recognize? Uh, I'll also spend time talking about uh, volume, structure and volume, solidity of forms, and, and how you achieve that on, on a flat surface, that illusion of depth. Um, we will talk about one of the most critical and I think one of the most difficult parts of painting and drawing, and that is being sensitive to, to edge quality. How soft or how hard is an edge? And again, to what degree is that soft or hard? And then I'll talk about color. Um, I work with, a, as I mentioned, a pretty limited palette, as did some of the great artists that I've studied in the past, like Andrew Zorn, Joaquin Soroya, John Singer Sargent, Ray Kinsler, also building on those. So we work out of a pretty simple palette with the primaries and a few additions, but I'll spend a lot of time talking about the importance of color harmony and keeping your palette fairly simple and good value to increase the feeling of, of even more uh, more sophisticated color than you might think you can get out of a limited palette. So those are some of the sort of five principles I'll talk about while I'm there. But we'll also talk about the importance of being an artist first, an artist that paints whatever that nature presents him, landscape, still life, or portrait. And then there's nothing wrong with focusing on a particular subject, which is what I do with my portrait work, but to not discount how important it is that you also use your skill and your abilities to create uh, paintings outside of your studio, painting plain air, painting landscape, uh, painting interiors, uh, the figure, uh, and portraits. All right, any, any other questions? Yes, I wanted to know why you took uh, the paint off of your wood palette. How I take it off? Why? Oh, why? Okay, so I take the paint off of my palette at night because the oil, the certainly earth tones, began to dry very quickly. So come over to this side. So one, one of the areas that I clean off regularly is the mixing area. I'll even clean this off during the day sometimes, two or three times. The other thing that I clean off and try to remember to clean off at night are something like a yellow ochre, I don't have it out, but maybe a burnt sienna or a burnt umber because those earth tones dry very quickly and they can dry in a mixture overnight and I wouldn't be able to get this off. I used some mineral spirits earlier to thin this down and if I don't clean that off tonight but tomorrow it will be dry and I won't have a nice clean mixing area. The other problem with letting this paint dry over time is it builds up and it creates weight and that weight will be a counter to the weight that I have on the palette and it'll make the palette want to be tip away from me because it would get heavy or make it more difficult to use. I want it to be fairly light so that I can move around the room with it. 
So I clean it off. Bettina Stanky was a great artist um, that I had the privilege of going with Peggy Kinsler and Everett Kinsler to see on a couple of occasions out in Santa Fe. And she worked with a palette like this, but she kept it stationary on a table. And she would let the paint build up over years. And so she had this tower, this wall of paint around here where for maybe 10 years, she had squirted out new white paint every day. And that didn't, that was, it didn't bother her because she didn't carry it. But I like to be able to move around with my palette through the day. So I'll hold it and I don't want there to be added weight that is unnecessary. So it's a little bit of some practical things to keep your painting, uh, sorry, your, your palette from, from getting too heavy and from getting, and, and sort of reducing its usefulness. Because if you had this area just full of paint every day, it would be very confusing, I think, as you look at it. The other thing is, um, this is where I put medium. So I might put something in here that dries the paint faster. And I really have to be conscious of that. So if I'm working maybe as little as 12 to 14 hours later, passages that I mix here can begin to get very dry. So you have to clean that out, clean that off periodically. So I can just use a little bit of mineral spirits and it'll just wipe right off. But boy, tomorrow that would get much more difficult. So that's why I do it. This, um, hey, hey, Shane, um, we're having a little difficulty. Uh, Zoom has uh, become so popular that uh, they've had to upgrade it a couple times or just to keep up with going from 20 million subscribers to 300 million oh in four months. Wow. And we just had a recent upgrade and it's not allowing us to unmute everybody when Anthony tries to unmute them. So oh. we've got, so a, some, we have a couple of uh, questions here. Oh, I see. Yes. I can read to you from Christine White. Uh, she says um, that she's struggling with, oh, that's the unmute, but she says uh, that she loves your work. It's gorgeous, but also thoughtful. Looking at your in progress pieces where you are waiting for people to come and sit again, what level of finish are you looking to achieve in the final sittings? How do you know when you're done? Oh man, what a good question and what a hard question. Um, and, and, and I will say that what I am looking for is based on the many artists that I have studied over the years I've been painting having a hope and desire that there'll be certain elements of the painting that somehow has the feeling of their style or the, um, uh, whether it be the animated brushwork or it be um, the simplicity or it even be, and I hate to say it because it's very difficult to teach this, or it even just be a feeling that hits me, that it feels right. There is an element to that with your work that it satisfies you and you hope that you can, doesn't mean that I like it, which I, by the way, I want to make that clear. I probably have never sent a painting out of the studio that I was, that I really liked. I might, to, to, to borrow from what I was taught by Everett Raymond Kinsler over all those years, to say I am comfortable with letting the painting go. And that's what happens. I will say to myself, I'm comfortable it satisfies some things that I was looking for, not all things, but I now feel like the client is happy. And, and, and in a way, in a way, I'm happy enough where I'm as happy as I'm going to be because I am never, ever really happy with anything that I do. If you bring back all 500 plus commission portraits that I've done since 1990 and leave them with me, I will work on every one of them if you give me a chance because there will be either something or a lot of some things that I will want to change. And I think, and I, I know, excuse me, I know that that is healthy because that means that I am growing and that I have this sort of dissatisfaction or a little bit of something in me that is saying that, that needs to be more, that needs to be something else. Um, when I bring a client in, there's two things that has happened. One, I do feel comfortable or ready to now have them see the progress of the painting. Sometimes they're there very early. So I've just begun, maybe, maybe even have someone in when it's not much further than this. 
sometimes when the painting is more like the doctor I showed you when it's much further along and that there's practicality in, involved and in, in when you're dealing with commission work you know where is the subject how often can they sit I like to I ask for a initial sitting if I can do some sketching and photographing I like a sitting in the middle if a minimum and I like to get a sitting at the end if I can that's a modern approach to portrait painting, which by the way, is more than many artists ask for today because of the digital photographs and the computer screens. Younger artists are getting further and further, I fear, away from just sitting with their clients and working with them from life. But having those sessions, what I'm looking for is what do I not think, what it was it that my painting doesn't have that I now see that I'm, as I'm being reintroduced to the person in real life again? Or what is it that I see that I, that I think works? And I'm gonna leave that alone. So I might find that I'm suddenly working on the eyes because I really am missing something, but I don't touch the rest of the face. Or I don't touch the face, but I feel like the hands are not working for whatever reason. So I'm gonna spend time on the hands. But in terms of the finish, I am really looking for just something that satisfies what I want stylistically uh, and that satisfies this desire to create not just something that you can say measures like the person, but even surpasses that and feels like the person. And so when someone walks in, they say, that is, that is Dr. Jones. I mean, that is just Dr. Jones. It may not have every eyelash. It may not have every whisker in his mustache. But I hope if you look at it as you walk in the room, you think that is the man that I, I, I think Shane has painted. So that's what I'm looking for. Well, Skip Eshelman is actually wondering what your actual painting schedule is on a daily basis. Oh, so my, my schedule on a daily basis, and I will we'll, we'll discount what we've all been going through the last couple of months because that's been totally bizarre. Uh, and what's bizarre about it is that I've had so few people here. I've had almost nobody here. Sittings have been postponed. Travel has been postponed. And so I found myself a little bit, uh, a little bit lost uh, in that period. I knew how to work from home. Uh, I just didn't know how to do it totally without having people coming and going. And so it's been weird. But beyond that, the way my normal schedule is, is to get up in the morning uh, you know, sometimes fairly early. I used to get up for years very early, but now I'll get up maybe between six and seven o'clock. Uh, I have my breakfast. I start checking emails. Uh, Becca, my assistant, comes in uh, around nine o'clock. She will have found that I've already been down here putzing around, uh, maybe working a little bit uh, in my pajamas on a painting that's on the easel. Um, uh, maybe go and sit down at her desk and make a few notes of things that I want her to do when, she's, when she arrives. Uh, Becca has been working with me uh, essentially um, since 2002. There was a period of time when she moved away and worked with me long distance, but she's been my assistant since she was out of college. Uh, she works full time in the studio to help me manage uh, every aspect of my work. Um, and then by uh, 10 o'clock, I'm hoping that most of the business side of working as an artist is out of the way for a while, and then I can begin working. Uh, I, I usually do not arrange for sittings before 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I will have a sitting in the afternoon in the summertime as late as three or four o'clock, uh, but not much past that because the light begins to dim uh, from my north lights and I like to work from life uh, under natural light if I can. If I'm not having sittings, I'm working from photographs and I'm still pinning photographs up around me with tape instead of working from computer screens. I've tried to make the computer screen transition. I sometimes do it, but I've just become so accustomed to interpreting things from photographs that uh, meaning the snapshots instead of a digital image that that's what I do mostly. And I'll tell you there's something a little bit to that in that when the photographs are not too good, and I do not claim to be a photographer, when they're not too good, I'm using more of my imagination and my senses and the things that I remember that I think add to the creative element of producing the work than looking at these, what has really become 
somewhat remarkable and highly defined digital images. So I, I'm careful that I don't, and Peggy knows this word, Peggy, you remember this phrase well, be careful not to be so seduced by those images. And, and Everett Kinsler was very concerned that if you get a little too uh, locked in to those digital photographs, you'll find yourself copying them and not working enough out of your imagination and, and here too from your heart as you work. So, um, and, the, and my days are long. So um, I may not, I may work on and off uh, throughout the day until dinner time, have dinner with my family, and then in the evening come out to quote, clean my palate at 10 o'clock. And I suddenly find myself working on something that I thought I would adjust in 10 minutes. And then I've worked two or three hours on a head and I didn't mean to do it, but suddenly it's, you know, two in the morning and I realized that I went into that realm that you all know so well, which is that glorious place when you have lost all sense of time and space and you're just working. And the dangers of working from home that many of you know well now, particularly if you just started doing this a lot during the COVID thing, which is that you can work all the time and suddenly you've, you're working, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. So that's, that's my typical schedule. It's Monday through Friday with some work on Saturday, but I've got two little girls. So, um, well, Maddie's, she's 18, but she's still little to me. So I've, I have spend more time with my family on the weekends than I did before I had children. Uh, but I um, will find myself sometimes painting even a little bit on Sunday afternoon if it's quiet and the, and the girls have found other things to do. But I don't have sitters on the weekends. I just had a request from a client that I'm painting their two young boys if they could do a Saturday because he's a physician and he's so tied up with this virus during the week at the hospital. He wanted to know if we could do a Saturday and I've agreed to do a Saturday. So that's well, the, I, I, and, I, and by the way, I, I, I don't eat lunch hardly at all. I, I, I used to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich every day because I don't want to miss time away from the, with the light. Uh, now it's a quick yogurt because I got too fat during all the COVID stuff. And uh, Peggy, I've lost 17 pounds. 17 Good pounds. Good for you. Yeah, I feel much better. Good. <laughs> Kane, I've got another question here from Christine Knapp. It's kind of an unusual question. It has to do with what kind of varnish you use. But she also says, uh, in finishing touches on a painting, in the client's home, did you instruct them to use a certain varnish on the painting months later, or did you apply it yourself? Oh, that's a great question. So th it was always a challenge related to this uh, for many years because I recommended using a combination of a, of a, a Damar or Damar varnish with a little matte varnish and a little English distilled turpentine, kind of third, a third, a third a third of Damar, a third of Matt, and a third of English distilled turpentine because it's, it's really the most stable of the turpentines. It's very expensive. Uh, and I would put that on six months to a year after the painting was completed. And it was always a challenge because if it was for a client out of town, you found that to be difficult to go back and do that later. So a combination of things I would do. Sometimes I would work directly with a local gallery or framer to tell them what I liked on the painting and then tell them how to mix it and to put it on the painting for me. Sometimes if they were in my city or if I found myself in their city again later, I would actually go buy the, the materials there in Dallas or wherever and I would go visit the client and sit the painting on their dining room table because very few people use their dining room tables anymore and it was a place that would be quiet we put the portrait on the dining room table and I would varnish it, have a nice visit with the client and then tell them that tomorrow they can put the painting up. But then about 15 years ago or so, I was introduced to Gambar, um, which is a great gambling product. It's a synthetic varnish that is endorsed by the way, by the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. They use it on their work now. That's there when they clean and varnish work. And you can put that gambar on the painting when the painting is dry to touch. Now, I would tell you, I am not a nerd when it comes to materials. I know, I, I sadly know too little about materials. My understanding was for a long time that 
that varnish did not become part of the paint so that you could actually lift it off in a cleaning 50 years from now. I think that Dawn Whitelaw has since found out that no, it, didn't, it actually becomes part of the paint. So it absorbs in and becomes part of the paint, but does not damage the paint. It's just that you can't clean it off 50 years from now. Uh, but you could still get some dirt off. You just wouldn't get the varnish off. What, what happens with old traditional varnishes, they protect the painting. They absorb the dirt and the smoke and whatever else is in the room over 50 years. And then you can very gently with a piece of cheesecloth and, and a, a little English distilled turpentine very lightly re remove the old varnish and all the dirt. And then you can, um, you can re-varnish it. So do a little research. I'm not so sure which, what the answer is, if it becomes part of or if it doesn't. And I'm not so sure you will find the answer. Do you need me to hold it? Yeah, Maddie's, Maddie's now choking. So I'll, I'll hold her. It's one problem after another having this kid in here. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and uh, Margaret Miller is wanting to know how you adjust your light in the evening light when north light has gone off and you're now working in the evening what do you do great question so i have two things that i do um one i'm gonna try to do this myself all right one do you see these these are lights that are on each side of my window i have the lights installed so that they are the direction of the light in the window and then over here i've got this crazy panel of switches and this this switch here controls the lights and you see them come on so at night these lights supplement the window light now they are not as good as the artificial light i also have a small round um, light that i normally keep in here but i've actually loaned it to maddie let's go down maddie i'll go can i take them down to your space for a second Good boy. Good boy. I'm going to take you down to Maddie's taking, Maddie's taking over my teaching studio. And so she's made it her studio. And what, there we are. So this is where we go. This is a, a little cottage that was built in the 1950s. And I've used it for teaching since I've been here. And uh, oh, so Maddie's, Maddie's, this is where Maddie's working right now you see she's got some artificial light on right now along with some north north windows that we installed up there and this is the light this is by the way also my model stand that maddie has stolen from me out of my studio that um we'll figure out how to get back but here this little round light is fantastic for using on a subject that you might not have enough light on uh, or to even use on your easel at night um, to paint by. And here's the information on it, you can see. It's called dry cast. And it's so thin, you can pack it in your suitcase with your clothing and take it with you if you needed to have some supplemental light somewhere you're working. Maybe you've gone on a plane air, air painting trip and you want to paint in your hotel room at night, you can put this thing in the bottom of your suitcase and take it with you. The uh, security people at the airport always want to look at it, but nobody's ever told me I can't take it. But it works great as a supplemental light for working at night. We were introduced to this light when uh, Everett Kensler was interviewed by a television station here in Nashville, and the man that filmed him brought this light to shine on him when they interviewed him. And so we all loved it so much, we immediately yeah, ordered one from um, Amazon. But anyway, this is Maddie has set up a studio for herself. By the way, you want to know what happens to old palettes? Here is all of my old palettes over 30 years. Uh, Maddie, I've kept them all and Maddie has decided to make them uh, art on her wall. Thanks, David. That's a good question. I, I forget was it I forget who asked that. Margaret Miller. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, we, have an, we have another question from Christine Knapp. She wants to know, now this is a, a suspicious question, 
Uh oh. So now, where do you get your commissions from? Oh, where do I get my commissions from? She's thinking Quit. of, you know, she's thinking of trying to step in the middle, I think. <laughs> no, it's a good, that's fine. No, uh, I, welcome, I welcome the competition. No, um, so where, oh, I'm sorry, Maddie. Thank you. You want to take over again? Okay. So where do I get my commissions? My commissions come from a lot of different directions. So um, now being an artist for, um, 30 years, I have worked on the walls all over the place. So every year I get uh, some work that is a referral from past commissions that I've done, where they ask someone who did this, and then they, it's so great because now it's so easy to find. You just Google it and there you find the person. Some uh, work, and not as much, but I, I mean, not very much, but I mean, maybe one uh, or two paintings in a year will come as a result of someone looking for artists online and they stumble on my website, possibly through a website called uh, Stroke of Genius, which represents, which is a sort of a, a one place where you can find a lot of portrait painters' websites. Sometimes it's just a Google search and they stumble on me. Um, I also work with um, representatives like Portraits Incorporated, which sell specifically portrait artists uh, work. And I have a couple of other gallery representation as well. Uh, and then sometimes work comes as a result of, I, I look up on some PR that I wasn't expecting or seeking. I have only, in my 30 years, I have only purchased one magazine advertisement ever. Um, and it was recently, a year ago, I put a quarter page ad in Country Life magazine, which goes all over the world, but particularly in the UK. And um, we actually had an email this morning from a woman in London asking about uh, what my price would be for a certain portrait. And my guess is, I haven't found this out yet, but my guess is she found that ad in Country Life magazine. Um, I was interviewed for a series, or, sorry, a magazine that goes into hotels. You know, many of you walked into a motel or a hotel and you find this magazine sitting on the desk that tells you about local things, local restaurants. Someone called me about interviewing me for one of those publications in a big Hilton chain all over, no, sorry, not Hilton, Omni chain all over the country. And uh, someone came in and sat down in a hotel somewhere and flipping through and saw this article about me and called me and I got a commission to do a full figure portrait from a guy from Denver, Colorado. So it, it comes from all directions. Um, now one of the things that I have always done and enjoy it is um, as a portrait painter, most people who paint portraits are not, usually are not of the introverted kind. So they don't usually hide in their studio and slide paintings under the door and they enjoy engaging people and being with people. So any opportunity that I've had to speak about my work or historical artists work or in, participate in some type of um, organized event where I can meet a lot of people uh, I usually say yes if I can schedule it because invariably I either give a number of cards that day or I meet someone that later it comes back to me as a, as a portrait. And so I, I don't shy away from opportunities to share what I'm doing with others. So that's, that's the way a lot of the work comes. Fabulous. Well, just to let you guys know, uh, we are recording Shane's session today, and Pam has us building a portion of the SKB website where all of these interviews like this will be housed. And it's not up and running yet, but Anthony will have that in place uh, probably in the next week or so. And uh, where you, and for people who couldn't make it to uh, today, uh, they'll be able to come and uh, then play the video. And Anthony's working on that now, and he'll have that in gear very soon. And um, does anybody else have questions for Shane? Well, I think you've done a magnificent job today, Shane. The oh, thank you. The check thank will be in the mail. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. listen, I, I am so excited uh, to have the opportunity to be with you all. I look forward to it uh, September. 
I have not spent a lot of time out west, but I have been uh, to Wyoming a couple of times and Montana and that general part of the country, and it is gorgeous out there. I envy you all those wide open spaces and those beautiful mountain scenes, and um, it's it's just gorgeous. And so I'm looking forward to to seeing not only the landscape again, but being around the people because I there's some of the friendliest people on earth are out out your your way so i can't wait to be with you all oh there was a question that popped up but i lost it because i don't have my bifocals on what is the best advice you could give to an artist just getting started with their career may i ask answer one more david sure okay uh the best advice i can give for a young artist just beginning their career um uh the the um where did it come from? My friend Jared Brady, is that who said that? Yeah. Way to go. I, I, I so admire your work. I love following you on uh, Instagram and uh, I think you're a fantastic painter and uh, and I'm very inspired by seeing your work. I, I love seeing it. Sometimes I miss it, but but my, my daughter Maddie Ree will point something out that you've done. Uh, you're, you're just doing beautiful work and also you're going exactly in the right direction. Um, so first off and first and foremost, um, from what I learned is that you focus on the work number one. So you are focused on growing as an artist always. And that is the premier thing that you do in order to grow your career, which your career grows by as the quality of your work grows. And so you constantly focus on trying to become a better artist. That's number one. Uh, and number two, um, you do what you're doing, which is share your enthusiasm for being an artist, sharing with others th your passion. And that comes through not only sharing your work, but it also comes through sharing in lots of other ways, writing about things that you enjoy, writing about why you love being an artist, talking about that to others. And then not, it's very difficult, I think, even as artists that enjoy uh, painting people, um, it's very difficult sometimes to sort of show your work because you feel like you're sort of touting, you know, tooting your own horn, you know, touting your own work. And I, it can be done in a way, I think, humbly, because that's where your heart is. I know that's where your heart is, Jerry. And that is that you know that you know that you're growing and you know that the work you're doing now is better than the work you did a year ago. At least that's what all of us hope. But you also can compare your work events against some of the great artists of the past. And so if if that doesn't humble you instantly, then you know you're not in the right place in your mind. Um, so, you know, you don't have to ever make excuses for what you're doing. You don't tell your potential clients that, well, you know, this is no sergeant, but here's what I've got. But what you do is you share honestly that uh, this is what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that people like it. I'm driven to do more. I'm driven to find ways to, uh, to open new doors. I'm interested in selling my work as a way of continuing my study as an artist and growing as an artist. And uh, I think that people will really enjoy the fact that you have such a humble attitude and such a clear idea of, of how you are proceeding as an artist, which is that you are working one day at a time, one year at a time at becoming a better and better painter. And so um, for a young artist, I always say, Focus on the work, make it as good as you can possibly make it, and then don't be shy about sharing it with others. And one other little secret, by the way, and I know you do this very well, and I'm sure many people on the call do, um, price your work to sell. I mean, price your work to go out the door. You might look at the quality of your painting and say, you know, I see people selling paintings that I think are not as good as this for $5,000. But there are so many variables to that, where they live, how long they've been doing it, who they've met, who has bought into who they are as an artist and who hasn't. And what I feel is, is true, the more you can have hanging out there, the more people you will find that will want your work. And when you're starting, you want more work on the walls, not less work on the walls. You don't want more work on your walls than you'd have on your potential patrons walls. So if you have a painting that you think, gee, this is, this is, I think one of my best pieces and it's a 24 by 30 and you start comparing that to your contemporaries and you think, gee, they're selling it for 3,000 or 5,000 or 8,000. 
you know, bite the bullet and sell it for 2,500, get it on the wall. And um, my goal as an artist was to make sure that I was eating and paying my rent and having enough money for supplies and then having enough money to put a little bit in the bank. Because believe me, and you've seen it right now, you will have periods of great growth and more people to paint for than you can find or more people to sell to in the galleries than they can fill. And then suddenly you will have a time when you can't sell something because of the economy as a whole or just something that's going on even in regionally. And so you've got to always be putting a little money in an emergency fund to help support you when suddenly you're finding the work slows down. And I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you it might come, it will come. And there will be a moment when suddenly you're not selling as well or not finding as many people to buy the work. And that is not because of you. That's because of, I'm sorry, it's likely not because of you. It could be because of you, but it's likely not going to be because of, of you. And so if you can prepare yourself to weather those storms, you could not have predicted what we're all going through now. None of us could but you could have predicted at least a modest uh, or even a, a large slowdown in people spending their money on what I consider to be an essential thing, having art, but it is not really, it is still a luxury. But I do know this, everyone turns to art eventually, even as they're going through these very lean times that we may be struggling with for a time. I know that they turn to music first because it's the most accessible, it is the easiest to acquire, and it does feed your soul in a certain way. But they turn to visual art as well for comfort and beauty and inspiration. And as soon as they can, they begin to find ways to release that money to acquire work again that they can live with and, um, and, and have in their homes and their offices, etc. cetera. So, um, just just keep on doing what you're doing. And, and I know you personally, I mean, I know, I've met you, but I know your work personally. And I know that if you continue on the path that you're on, you will continue to grow the rest of your career and not have any trouble uh, making your livelihood, your uh, your art. Um, but um, just, just uh, remain always um, focused on making the next painting the very best you can make it and then go to the next and the next. That's a great question. I love answering that question. Any more? Anybody help? Because I've got a I've got a camera person and I still have 10% battery left on my phone. <laughs> well I think that we've done we've done really good here today. You've done a right. tremendous job and you've shown us all over the place and you've wandered around the back 40 here. <laughs> you've taken us see you've shown us where Maddie works and I mean this has been a lot of fun. Oh thank uh, you very much. I've enjoyed it so much. I, I had never done a Zoom call until about two weeks ago and now I've done three. I think this is my third and uh, I'm, I'm really liking that we have this technology. It's really wonderful. Well just just for your notice folks um, I've gotten a recent thing from Zoom uh, telling me that the present uh, version of Zoom that you have, if it's below five, they're going to quit uh, allowing that version below five to function at the end of May. So mm -hmm. they're forcing everybody to upgrade. And um, it's just 